Hello and welcome to the West London Sport QPR podcast as we look ahead to Marty Sabuentes' first home match as manager following last Saturday's 1-1 draw with Rotherham. While that well-earned point in South Yorkshire on the face of it is not a result to get the pulses racing, with the team on a pulling front run of form, having lost six on the bounce, it was important to stop the rot. Uh, I'm joined once again by former Rangers skipper Kevin Gallon and Kev, a QPR t- team playing 4-3-3, building from the back, playing through the thirds and passing the feet. Illy's chair even scoring a great, a great goal. It's like being transported back 12 months. Yeah, uh, I said it last week, um, you know, those players are used to playing that. They've been brought up on that sort of style of football of rolling out from the back and, like you said, playing through the thirds. Most youth teams, academies um, in this country play that way. So it, it wasn't, you know, we, we talked about will it take time? Yeah, it will take time as in uh, to get, the manager's, um, you know, thoughts and what he re- he wants. But, you know, those players have been playing that way, you know, for the last, pretty much the whole career. So it wasn't, you know, a bit, a bit drastic. But uh, we were talking just before we come on and it's like, if you, if you roll the ball out and you pass the ball and keep possession, you're not going to concede as many goals as when you're, you, you're going into games and, at the end of the game, you've got 20, 25% possession and you're constantly defending. And there's nothing worse when you're a football player, and especially if you're an attacker, is when, and a defender, where you have to defend the whole game. And QPR have been doing that this season and uh, obviously the manager lost his job and the new manager's come back in and, and he obviously sees that these players are suited to the way he wants to play, which I think was pretty obvious. Um and uh, yeah, so you know, you get you keep the ball, you have possession, you create chances, you score goals eventually if you have more of the ball. And is it a work in progress for the new manager? He'd probably say yes because he wants to win. We got to he wants to win matches, but we have to win matches to get out of the situation that we're in at the moment. Yeah, so um, Sventes he had just two training sessions before before the match, and you know, the, I mean, the most stark. Changes really were the, the reintroduction of Chris Willock straight into the team. Um, Elijah Dixon Bonner came in for his uh, his full debut and uh, full league debut, sorry, and um, and certainly added some legs and some energy I- into the midfield. And looking, you know, very good on the football. Um, you know, he's come through Arsenal and Liverpool's academy, so you know he's obviously got a good good pedigree behind him. Um, it does sort of beg the question, though, Kevin, that what was Gareth Angus doing? Why why do you think? He tried to make it so different. Is it was it just how he saw the game, or he just felt that this that was what that was what was needed to kind of make the team climb the table? What do you think it was? I always think um, if 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 you're a manager and you, and you one person's t- people are telling you to do it this way, and other people are telling you to do it this way, and then you think to yourself, well, look, I'm going to do it my way, and if I'm going to go down on the sword, I'm going to go down doing it my way. And we had this, we've had this chat for a year now. The way they play, Gareth played at Wimbledon. Uh, sorry, at Wickham. Or well, he played under, you know, he played at Wimbledon. That's the style of football they played. But the way he played the game and managed at Wickham was long ball. And and everyone, and I used to hear things like saying, "Well, if you're if you've got Akin Fem in your team, you're not going to start passing it around." But then I would come back to, "Well, if you buy Akin Fem, where you're." you're going to play that way because you bought him to play that way. It's not like uh, he inherited this, uh, an Akin Fenwa. He actually went out and got an Akin Fenwa to play that way. And it just I just feel like you go back to your default when you're under a bit of pressure, but I just feel like he, when you come in as a manager, I feel that if you've got a group of players are suited to a style of football, you ha- and the best way to get results is to play that sort of style of, passing and moving, then you have to sort of, even if it goes against your beliefs until you get your foot in and you can make and people and you can make signings in and outs or whatever, you have to play to your strengths of your of the 11 or the 15 that you've got. And and Gareth didn't. And I'm sure this new manager, is it Fuentes? Have I got that mm-hmm. right? It's Fuentes, yeah. Yeah, he will play a style of football. But I would say the people upstairs have brought him in to go back to that style of football of what they want to do is back to sort of, you know, possession-based football, 
developing players coming through the youth team or from the academy, trying to do that and giving those chances and uh, to play good football and entertainment football. And at the end of the day, what, so I remember Ray Wilkins used to say, we play and we win and there may be 13,000, 14,000. And he would be thinking, you know, we should be getting, when we were in a premiership, we should get 15, 16 or 17s. And he, he would be a little bit disappointed if there was only 14 there. But then he'd he'd come in and he'd say, "Well, we're still we're still getting more than um, Phantom of the Opera," and what he was trying to say is, <laughs> "We're still packing them in more than Phantom of the Opera." What he was trying to say is, "We're in the entertainment business as well." I know you're in the, in the results business, but fans want to be entertained on the Saturday as well. They want the results first, but they want to be results and entertained. And it's quite um, you know, and I'm talking about this entertainment because it's came into my head is. Tottenham lost the other day against, um, lost at home to Chelsea 4-1. But the Tottenham fans are happy. But really, they lost 4-1 at home. But they've gone away happy because they've been entertained and, they've, and the manager stuck to his principles of high press, attacking football. But they still lost because they were entertained. And even I was, we all were entertained if you watched the match. It was mm. a really entertaining, really everyone was talking about it. So as a manager... You know, I think this Fuentes will try and play possession-based football, entertaining crowd. But first and foremost, he's got to get results and he's got to get results very quickly. But it all goes down to that thing we've always said. You can't win football matches if you haven't got the ball. Yeah, no, that's 100%. It's if you're defending and all the time and you're, you can, you can do the odd time and that happened against Burnley. But in general, over a season, that will not work. That can't, it won't work and... It's nothing worse than chasing the football all game. Nothing worse. I've been there, and one the, the one moment you switch off and you say, "I'm I'm, I'm going to be a bit lazy here, and I'm not going to chase this midfield runner," is usually the time when that midfield runner goes into the box and scores, or we aren't going to chase that fullback. And you can sort of see it where Elias Chair was playing left midfield, and the right back would be bombing on, and he sort of he's not an actual defender, and he'd let him go for a split second and then, and then react. And but that split second, that right back or that left back, whoever, has got three or four yards on you. And that's when goals get conceded, when there's overloads down wings and stuff like that. Mm. I mean, again, like, I mean, the wretched home form. I mean, I know that some of that predated Gareth's um, appointment, but I mean, the 12 games outside of the Watford game, there wasn't really much excitement at home. There wasn't really any games you can hang your hat on and say that was a really, really good home game. You know, Loftus Road historically has been, you know, when the noise is generated, when the team's attacking the loft in the second half, corners, free kicks, really having a go, wingers bombing down the line, you know, you might not always win, but at least you're kind of, there was none of that. None of that, really, in aims of zero. I can't recall no. an era of where it's so bad, but it just beggars belief that you play that style of football at home. Yeah, and no, but, that's going to change now. Well, I go the last season, the last game of the season, we played Bristol City and they passed us off the park. Mm. Is that right? It was Bristol yeah, City. Yeah. Last home game of the season. There, yeah. We played two up front, a four-four-two really, or five-three-two. But we, I remember we played Dykes, Dykes and Martin, and I remember thinking. Mm. The goalkeeper's kicking it up. Dykes can win a flick on, but who's chasing it? Chris Martin. And Chris Martin ain't got the legs to chase it. But that don't, that, that, that's just, you, you don't flick it on for Chris Martin to chase on to the, uh, for a runner. Chris Martin was a good player, and but his legs have gone. He never had much legs, even because I played with him 15 years ago at Luton, but, you know, he's 34, 35. He's not going to, get on flick-ons and, and outrun the centre-half, the young centre-half. And they literally picked up the pieces and just played played around us. They had an extra man midfield. They won't have an extra man on Saturday. We'll match them up. And there will be a, a case of, you know, who's going to who's gonna create chances? They're going to have the ball. We're going to have the ball. Who's going to create the most chances? Who's going to defend better? And I, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic that we'll get our first home win for the year or... <laughs> Uh, for the season on Saturday. Yeah. Obviously, Ilias Chair missing out due to suspension, which is, um, you know, a kind of significant blow, really. But I guess it will put more onus on on Chris Willock, who was welcomed back into the team. And, you know, I was up there at, at 
um, the New York Stadium. And I mean, the first half, he kind of, he looked rusty, which is understandable. He's barely played um, this season, you know. And uh, Sifuentes said afterwards, it probably really wasn't his game. It was a difficult game for him, kind of a physical didn't get much time on the ball, but he did grow into it. And there were some encouraging signs where he was sort of bringing the ball out of the fence and um, linking up with chair and, you know, and the, the build-up to the goal was a lovely goal. It was a really, you know, the, the finish from chair was top class, but just the move itself, it was Reggie Cannon was involved and Willock's involved. And then, you know, Kenneth Powell's done really well to pull a reverse pass back in. And it was, a, you know, nice to see. Um, but I mean, just with, with chair not playing, um, it's a real chance now for Willock to kind of yeah, it's show true. what the team's been missing, isn't it? I mean, he's, he's got he's got to step up. Um, he needs to get into uh, a rhythm, stay fit, at the rhythm of matches, and and you know he hasn't played often, so he, he's training. But you know, training and actual match fitness training, you can be you think you're really fit training fitness, but match pitch, match fitness is just that sort of step above that extra 5%. So you can train all uh, all the time, you know, and you'll be, you think you're 100%, but then once you get back into that first few first game, you're like, oh, I'm blowing here. This is, the tempo is so much quicker, the crowd, the anxiety of everything, um, the buzz, the nervousness. So you need to get into a rhythm of uh, playing every week and keep him, and keep him fit. And with uh, Illy's chair not playing, then, the onus will come on to Chris Willock because he's a, he is a good player when he's when he's on form, and he needs to show that you know time's running out. He's got his his contracts up at the end of the season, or what, what are QPR going to do? Are they going to? I've said we've we've discussed this before. Is is he going to is he um he's going to leave in January? Are we going to try and get some money for him, or are we going to let his contract run down and he's a free transfer because we need him to stay up? Is he going to re-sign or has he got an offer to go somewhere else? I don't know. Obviously, those um, who, who who might want him, who don't. But for him to be in a good position by the end of the season, he needs to step up his game and play well. Not only for him, but he, but we mm. are, as a club, need him to step up to get us out of this um, relegation zone that we're in. So, you know, it's all, it's all sort of up to him and I'm sure... It's, the manager, I can't say his name. The manager for Wentes is um wants Martin. him to Mar yeah, Martin. Martin, Martin. Will want him Martin will want him to step up because it will benefit him, the club, the team, if he steps up to the plate and gets back to the form that we seen last season at the start of last season. Have you ever did you ever have in your career, Kev, where you were uh, a manager just bombed you out? Just yeah, give you five minutes here and there, and then, and then, but then a new manager would come in, and you're back in the side again. I mean, what, 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 what's it like as a player when you just think I'm not going to get? It's not happening for me here with him. A new man comes yeah. in, and it's starting again. Well, what's what would what would Chris Willock's kind of mindset be at the moment? Well, Chris Willock will be thinking I've got a chance now to play. He's obviously he wasn't going to play under Gareth. I mean, because he didn't play him. So simple as that. Um, he'll be thinking I've got a chance and. What happens is the player when you have a new manager, the players that are the players that are not playing, you know, the first day of training, they're they're like buzzing because they're thinking, I've, I'm gonna, I've, it's a clean slate for everyone. I've got everyone has to go on the clean slate. I've got to try and impress him in, in my first training session because Marty, they said that he watched a lot of the games, previous games this season, so he's seen the players that have started and played, but the other ones who haven't really played, he hasn't really seen them. So that first training session, everyone's trying to make a massive, a big impression for the manager to say, hey, look at me, I should be in the team. So it's all like up for grabs to get in the team. And, you know, if you play, if you're training well, he might give you a chance. Two, if you do get in the team and perform, you'll probably stay in the team. So everyone's on a clean slate. Uh, Chris Willock must be thinking, you know, last week, I'm back in the team. He's obviously going to be playing unless he picks up an injury. He's obviously going to be playing on Saturday. And it's a big opportunity for uh, Chris Willock to not only press, impress the manager, but impress the fans as well to say, hey, look, I'm still a good player. I thought what was interesting from 
Sir Francis was after the game. I, I, I you know, he, he said that he um, he'd watched the games this season, but also he's watched games from going back last season and the season before, which in such a short space of time. So he said, like, he's given him an idea of like, okay, this is what they can do. It's what they've been doing. But he was a great pain to point out, right? He didn't want to, for want of a better phrase, throw any shade at Ainsworth. And he said, so that it's a, it's a clean slate. Whatever's happened before is forgotten. Don't worry about it. We move on. This is what what I want. And I mean, how long how long can that sort of last with the squad? They sort of go, oh yeah, great. Is it is it is it all about winning? If if you win that game, it kind of everyone continues to buy in. But if the results don't turn, does does it make it the manager's job even harder to get players on board? Well, yeah. The matter look, got to, got to start. The main thing is got to start winning. He's got. To, He's obviously will be picking a team that he obviously. I know it makes like the most sense ever, but you're picking the team that you think is going to give you the best chance to win on the mm. Saturday, uh, who's available and fit. Um, so look, the longer it goes on and you don't you don't win matches, and then the players who are not playing, there's always grumblings. And the hardest thing for any manager is is to keep the players who are not playing happy. That's the hot. That's the ones that are playing. They're happy. If you're playing every week, you're happy. The ones that are not playing, you got to keep try and keep happy and keep them on board. And then you know, you know, bringing them on a sub just to give them, you know, there's some minutes. Come on and impress me. You impress me as a sub. I'll, I'll think about playing you the, the next game. So they're, they're, that's the hard job of a manager, I'd say, is keeping the ones who are not in the starting eleven on the bench or in the stand happy and giving them a chance. But it goes back. Saturday's a massive game for QPR. Mm. We have to, we need three points. We haven't won, was it, for thirteen games? Is that right? This will be twelve games. They haven't won at home. Yeah, but how, when was the last time we won? Was it Cardiff? Or, no, Middlesbrough no, away. Middlesbrough. How, yeah. How many games was that? That's. that's you, put me, 12, I games? you put me on the spot here. Off the top of my head, I, I think. It's just, I'm just thinking. Not because, I'm not 100 percent off the top of my head. I don't know, but it's a lot. When was it, bro? August. It was like August, wasn't it? It was September, wasn't it? it was the. Um, I'm showing how professional I am now. I think it, yeah, it was the, before. It was before the international break. So not the last was, one, the one before. But, uh, anyway, it was it was a significant amount of time ago since they last won. So I'm, I'm <laughs> going to get it up now. I've got me. I've, just one second. Hold on. Meanwhile, uh, here's some music. <laughs> Middlesbrough was the 2nd of September, the last time we won. So we need some wins, and we need some wins yeah, quick, and we need some a few wins yeah, as well. Yeah. So. so there we go. So so Bristol City got the uh, you know, the, the return of Rob Dickey to Loftus Road. He's in form at the minute. He scored in his last two games, funny enough. Uh, you yeah. know, my, my proclamation uh, that you know, he could be as good as Ben White, which someone pointed out to me on Twitter the other day. Uh, probably not one of my better predictions. Um, so I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that and say, "You're all right. I got that one wrong." Um, but you were allowed to get one wrong, Ian. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty wrong, though, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. But um, but uh, but no. But in in all, in all, in all seriousness, he, he's coming back. He's going to have a point to prove. Um, it'd be interesting to see what sort of reception he gets. He was a you know, a, a good player for QBR for, you know, you know, a season and a half really, and then it all went sort of a bit pear shaped last year. Um, but I mean, they've just sacked their manager, Nigel Pearson. They've got Liam Manning, the former um, Oxford United and MK Dons manager, coming in. Uh, a manager who's actually interviewed for the QPR job before Mick Beale was uh, appointed. Um, I guess they're going to be in a similar back to QPR. New manager, point to prove. Yeah. But I mean, they're in a much better position than QBR on the table, so it'd be interesting to see how they approach the game. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll play um, they'll play a similar style, passing well, which they did last season, even under uh, Nigel Pearson. Um, they got some decent players. So have we. If we got, um, you know, um, it is a pity that chair isn't going to isn't is suspended. So someone has to step up. So Willock will play. Maybe um, a bit of pace in the team. Would he bring in Smith as another attacker, or who else we yeah. got? In the- yeah, Smith started on sat- Saturday, and uh, it wasn't great. To be fair, he got he got, he got taken off uh, 
You know, I, I do wonder with Smith, um, you know, the knock on him from previous managers was that, you know, his, his first touch and his, you know, ball retention perhaps wasn't what they wanted. That was certainly the case with Mark Warburton and, and Steve McLaren. So Gareth brought him back. He, he did okay. He did okay. He's played better this season, but he's played more as a an out and out sort of front man rather than a wing back, which he is more suited to. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how he, what, what he does there. I imagine he probably will keep his place in the side. Uh, Taylor Richards came on for him and flattered the deceive. He, you know, he had some good moments on the ball where he sort of beat a couple of men and looked good. And then, you know, so another, another, uh, but he's got to take some blame. He's got to take some blame for the goal. It was a really lazy header that he nodded back to Sam Field. And Sam Field made the foul, which led to the free kick, which then led to the goal. So, you know, good and bad there. I don't think perhaps he's ready to start, Richards, but... Well, he, he's um, another player, Ian, who needs to step up. I mean, yeah. you're talking about clean slates. I mean, come on. How many managers now? Mm. He's been under Bill Critchley, Gareth. He's known his fourth manager. And if you don't step up under this one, then you're thinking, oh, a minute. Even you've got to look in the mirror and say, actually, is it, it's not the manager, it's actually me. Yeah. Well, he's been at a few clubs as well. You know, he's Fulham and Man City paid money to take him there. And then he went to uh, to Brighton. So he's been at, you know, some decent clubs before he came to QPR. And, you know, really, you know, I remember speaking to, to Gareth Angsa sort of um, at, at Wickham about him, uh, at Hamilton about him. And he was sort of saying he should be doing more. He should be. You know, dominating sort of these sort of games, and and he, and he wasn't. I think it's almost like someone needs to put a rocket up him and just kind of, you, you know, you, you do get some players that look a little bit just kind of languid and sort of. But in the modern game, you, you've got to run around, haven't you? You can't be, yes. you know, even the best teams, right. the top teams. You know, you got to you got to push on, you know, press on the front, and you know, you can't just it's not going to come to you and just sort of, you know. Ian. stroll around thinking that I can just kind of pick pick a few passes here and there. He needs to kind of, you know, find some work rate. Yeah. Ian, I would still be playing if I could run around. Mm. That's why people retire, because you can't run anymore. So mm. when you can run, run. Kenny Jackett used to say to me when uh, we used assistant manager, I said, Kevin, in training, you need to get your heart rate up a bit. I, went, I just looked at it. I was like, baffled. What are you talking about? He said, just, you know, get your, your beat up, your heartbeat up. I went, okay. So what I used to do then was, you know, you're playing like an 8v8 or a small-sided game, and you should sort of stand up front. And if the ball's down one end, you sort of just, you're sort of out of the game. I used to just go, right, I'm going to just play midfield all the time and run around and just get my heart rate. I'd just get a good sweat on and, and come up, come off training as if, saying, well, I didn't have a great <laughs> little training session there, but at least I ran around and I got something out of it. Hmm. Yeah, but um, but Dick, um, but Dixon Bonner, he, he you know, he, he, he looked, did well, you know, did okay on his debut and that, and you know, he's another player. I mean, I've, I've seen a bit of the, the Paul Furlong development team this season, and he always looked impressive when he played. He kind of, you know, just sometimes a new manager comes in with fresh ideas. He put him in, and he, he took his chance with both hands. Um, I mean, you, you'd think he'd be very harsh for him to be dropped. I mean, Colback and Dazelle are available after suspension. So, um, with Chair being out, maybe, you know, Dazelle might kind of play that sort of more, the, the chair role. Do you think that would, that, that could work? Uh, maybe. Uh, it's the case, back to Dixon and Bonner, it's like, and you said he, he made his day when he played well. Yeah, because we had the ball, but whenever yeah. I ever seen him, he never had the ball because we never yeah. had the ball. So you can't... Yeah. Is he any good? I don't know. Never mm. had the ball. So it's difficult. Um, Dazelle, Colback's back. Yeah, I think Colback will come in. It's interesting. What, what, what's he going to do? But he's going to stick to 4 3 3. That's, that's his style, isn't it? Mm. It seems that way. Yeah. He's sort of, I, I read that. He says 4 3 3. Um, Although he, he has point, he has made point, pains of making it, saying that, um, you know, 4 3 3 is what I want to play, but I'll. I'll pick a formation that I think suits the players I have. So yeah, I mean that's a sensible, pretty obvious, really. But a sensible, yeah, obvious thing to say. You don't. It goes back to what Gareth was doing. We're playing a style of football that didn't suit any of the players. You know, you come in, you assess the squad, and you say this is the best way. 
I want to play this way, but, you know, sometimes I ain't got the players to play this way. So I might have to do something a little bit different until we get a few transfer windows and I can get that player in that style I want. So be interested in because we need what will happen is we need some wins. We need some wins quick. Be interesting to see what happens in January. Uh, uh, have we got any money to, you know, get some players in? I know we still we haven't got any loan players, so the loan market is open to us. And it'd be interesting to see the targets and what he feels. I still feel we need another striker. That's like plainly obvious. We've been talking about this for three years now, but that's an obvious one. And maybe another winger, a bit, you know, a bit more pace in the team. So it'd be interesting to see what they do. And with all this sort of in the background with renaming stands and stuff, mm. was that, I know you might know more to it, Ian, was that, more on FFP or to get some money and to make some signings in January? Uh, what, you know, what do you think? I would say it's probably all of the above. I think there's, you know, I mean, it's it's not no secret that FFP, you know, the club are quite close to the FFP threshold. Um, you know, and any any money that's put in for naming rights and stuff like that, it's always, you know, they, they've obviously done it for, for a reason. Um, particularly mid-season, so um, I mean, you'd have thought that the managers come in. There must be some sort of promise that in January you can bring one or two in. It'd have to be. Um, again, I mean, loans mm-hmm. surprising. No one brought in on loan in 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 the summer, which begs the question. You know, there's no there's no director of football at the moment, is there? Yeah. You know, and they have said the club they are going to appoint a director of football. Well, it hasn't happened yet. But, I mean, you know, with the director of football, I mean, the obvious thing is just sort of like, well, they're responsible for transfers and Lee Hughes seem to be running that sort of side of things at the moment. But contacts with other clubs and that, that's what the director of football you need, isn't it? That's what, you know, at, at Palace, I know the job, the, rug, the role that Dougie Friedman does, it's not just wheeling and dealing, is it? It's a lot more to a director of football than... Than that. Well, you have to have um, relationships with other t- with other people at other, at other football clubs and good relationships. And if you're going to get a loan player, if if just say a, a director of football and you contact him and say we want this player, I'll look after him. Yeah, I know you will. You're a good bloke. I know you'll look after him. We'll give him minutes. We'll get what you want and the stuff. You, you need that like a director of football is like you just said. It's not all about oh money but you know an avid club might say this I've got a lad on loan you can have this lad on loan he's really good I'd like him to come to your club you play good football do you understand it will yeah. suit him so you build up relationships like that and and I think every club the way it goes I mean the way it goes now there's no real it's not like a manager it's not an Alex Ferguson type job anymore where you manage the whole mm. club it's more director of football and there's the coach or the manager of the team. You coach the team, and we'll get the player, and we'll sign players to suit your style of football or the club style of football. And that was the model we sort of were on, but it sort of really in the in the summer just went out the window. Yeah, and and the thing is, well, like particularly with a manager who's come in from another country, his contacts in England aren't going to be with the clubs aren't going to be. That strong, you'd imagine that he's not going to be able to pick up the phone to 100%. someone at Arsenal or just go, Have you got a right back I can have? Yeah, <laughs> so that's what the, the conduit between the manager and that, that you know, and it's a big void at the moment. There's, you know, there doesn't seem to be any... because if you're doing if the manager has to do that, then he's taking his eyes off what he has to do on the training pitch as well, and you, you end up doing too much and mm. pretty much doing too much, and not doing the too much too well. So that's the, the, the role of director of football is has contacts, you know, uh, speaks to the manager. The manager says, I need a right midfielder. What what right midfielders are out there? And then you go through a list. Well, we, we might be able to get him. He's probably out of our price range. And there's so much, you know, there's so many things to signing a, a player that, that comes into it. Everyone just thinks, oh, he'll come. He won't. He might have a better offer somewhere else. He might want, not want to leave the club he's at. He might want too much wages. There's so many. The other club might say, I want a million pounds for him. And, well, we ain't got a million pounds. So it's, mm. it's a difficult job. And for a manager to do, who's just come in and, and you're 100% right, whose contacts are not really 
that strong in this country, I would say that it isn't that strong. He needs someone above him to help him. Mm. Yeah. Um, and um, I guess as well, like, because you've got, I mean, Paul Furlong's doing a really good job with the, uh, the development team. They, they're top of their league. Uh, Ahmed Watford 4 1 on Wednesday. Uh, again, these these players, there's some some nice players coming through. They, they're probably a long way from championship level, you know, a lot of 18, 19 year olds. But I mean, for their development, I guess you need a director of football to kind of get these boys out on loan somewhere. Where can they go? Yeah, exactly. So that's where the relationships with other clubs are. You need that's that's like the role of a director of football is contacts and you know even even having good contacts with agents. Yeah, I'd rather he come to QPR than go to this club because he's he's got a good relationship with the football club and the director of football. So yeah, it's it's, it's a strange one. Um, I don't think they can go into the January um, um, transfer window without one. Yeah. Yeah, and it, I mean, it needs to happen sooner rather than later. It, it really does. Um, you know, give the, the new the new guy time to get his feet under the table, and then you've got that look ahead to to what's needed in January. And you got um, SS squad, and you you got assess the squad, and then you'll have to speak to what the manager wants, and then you the, the director of football's there to help him. Mm. Yeah, but um, uh, but as I say, I mentioned Paul Furlong's. Uh, under 18s, uh, under 18, sorry, development side. They're, they're actually in action on Monday night. If and I was they're playing in the London Senior Cup. Do you ever play in the London Senior Cup, Kev? No, I did. Uh, no, I haven't. What's that all about? That's a new London one. Senior Cup. It's like the um, it's the, the cup for senior non-league teams in in London. Are you playing? Are you and, playing? Um, <laughs> sorry, are you playing in the Senior Cup? Well, I've never never good enough to play in the London Senior Cup, mate. But um, but no, in, in all oh, seriousness, no, like um, Brent, Who are they Brentford playing? are the. Brentford are the current holders, but uh, they play in it. Um, and uh, I think Watford, no, Watford aren't in it. There's, but certainly um, Brentford are in it. They won it last year. But they, they play Corinthian Casuals um, I've heard of them. on Monday night over not too far from over in Tolworth. And Corinthian Casuals are actually managed by um, Andy Gray, who once played for QPR, score of uh, two magnificent goals against Manchester United. Um, I was there. And then, and then, mysteriously sold back to Crystal Palace. But uh, yeah, I know, was there so, at that game. Two yeah, goal passes down the loft. Yeah. yeah, it was at shows of the time, doesn't it? It was QPR Man United on a Monday evening, late in the season, and there was about eleven thousand in the ground. Yeah, because there was a train strike. Yeah, I remember it. He scored two worldies. Yeah, two scored two worldies. Can you imagine that now? Man United playing QPR, and there being eleven thousand people in the ground. No. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Andy Gray. So a QPR connection in the opposite dugout to Paul Furlong um, on Monday night. But um, but again, it's I've, I've mentioned it before. You get down and watch them. Anyone who hasn't seen them, you get the kick off seven forty five at um, Corinthian Casuals on Monday. Um, there's some good young players in that team. You know, some plenty of goals. Uh, Stephen Baller, who I mentioned before, is very diminutive little forward. Um, you know. Got a good eye for goal. Scored a hat trick against Coventry early in the season. Um, there's a young fellow called Lauren Teller. He's a young, I think he's Algerian, only 18, but you know, looks like he's got a bit of talent about it. Likes a goal from long range. So um, certainly some players to watch. And you know, you, you'd have played with Paul Furlong Kev for many years. You know, a, yeah, great anyone who's met him will tell you what, what a gentleman he is of a guy, and doing Very a really good, good job with some of these young with these young players. A good guy to learn off. Yeah, no, Furs, as we call him. I see him a couple of month, uh, months ago at a reunion. Great bloke. Lovely man. Uh, we used to call him the smiling assassin because um, he's always smiling, but he would he would put his foot in as well on the centre half and get up smiling and be looking at him. Bloody hell, Furs done it again. You know the one where the centre half or the left back or right back clips it down the line and the centre forward comes across and nails him. He loved a bit of that, but yeah. Other than that, off the pitch, what a bloke. Lovely man. Yeah. And scorer of one of the great QPR goals in a in a playoff semi-final against Oldham. Yeah. That was uh, you know, I mean, what a tremendous night that was. I thought the yeah, I thought the ground was gonna collapse. It was absolutely one of the biggest uh, one of the best nights 
like on the pitch, obviously, but even like I've seen some great nights sitting in the stand, but that one was one of the best uh, atmospheres at QPR. I think a lot of people say that as well. It was, it was, uh, you know, not only the tremendous night and a tremendous win, but the atmosphere was absolutely unbelievable. One of your highlights as a, as a player? That yeah, game? definitely. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, really good night. Yeah, really good night. Um, it was a tough game. They were a good team, Oldham at the time. Ian Dowie was the manager. Uh, Langer's got sent off. I had to play right midfield, which, looking back, <laughs> I did it. But you know, I've obviously <laughs> rather been up front with Furs. Uh, but in the end, we got the win, and yeah, one of the best nights of uh, football for me. Yeah, that was you know, really good, really good night. Great memory. Well, let's hope that Saturday's a memorable night for QPR. What are you thinking, Kev, prediction-wise? Yeah, I mean, I, do you know what? I, uh, before before you said, because um, I completely forgot that Ilya's chair was in uh, was suspended, and, and that is a blow because he, he scored a really good goal on Saturday and he looked, you know, back to... You know what he can do, and he would have been full. Of, he would have been full of confidence going into this game after that goal. And um, I think he'll be a miss. So it's time for someone else. Like we look really to step up. I was going to say two nil before you said that, but now I'm going to go one nil uh, for QPR. I think you know the law of averages. We have to win. You know, we have to win, and this is an ideal opportunity. They've got a new manager who only can, he's only been in what the door a day, so. You know, he will try and get his ideas. They're a decent team. They've got some good players. Um, but, you know, with the crowd, new manager, first home grain, with the crowd behind him, and I'm sure the fans will turn up in their numbers like they have done all season and really support the team. And uh, I think we're going to win. I think we're going to win 1-0. Good stuff. Yeah, I'm feeling reasonably optimistic. I'm going to go a nervy 2-1. They'll go 2 0 up and then Bristol City will score with about half an hour to go and it'll be hanging Panics. for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, just goal, I just want to see a goal at the loft end. That's all I want to see. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, thanks again for your time, Kev. And uh, thanks for watching and listening. As, as I said before, we're, we're also on Spotify and um, iTunes. So subscribe and like if you can. And uh, We'll see you again soon.